Good morning. My name is Matthew Capone, and I'm the pastor here at Giant Mountain Presbyterian Church, and it's my joy uh, to bring God's Word to you this morning. A special welcome if you're new or visiting with us. We're glad that you're here, and we're glad that you're here not because we're trying to fill seats, but because we're following uh, Jesus together as one community. And as we follow Jesus together, we become convinced that there's no one so good, they don't need God's grace, and no one so bad that they can't have it, which is why we come back week after week uh, to hear what God has to say to us in his word. We took some time off for the season of Advent, and you'll remember we were in the book of Genesis, and we're returning this morning to our series in the Gospel of Mark. Now, the Gospels tell the story of Jesus in his life and his death and his resurrection, and the Gospel of Mark specifically asks us uh, these two questions that we've been asking together. First of all, uh, who is Jesus and how do we respond to him? Who is Jesus? How do we respond to him? And as we'll see uh, these, this morning, these are questions not just for Christians to ask. Um, in fact, they're questions for everyone. We're going to be in Mark chapter 3, starting at verse 22. And this passage asks us the question of how do we account for God's power in the world? What do we do with it? Everyone at some level longs for the powers of evil and darkness to be conquered. Now, different people in the world disagree about what those forces might be, and people disagree about the means to end them. Um, But we do probably all agree we want evil to come to an end. It's with that in mind that we ask this question of what is the source of Jesus' power. That's the question that the scribes in this passage uh, raise for us. And so without further ado, I invite you to turn with me in God's Word. In Mark chapter 3, you can turn in your worship guide. Uh, You can turn in your phone. You can turn in your Bible. No matter where you turn, remember that this is God's Word. And God tells us that His Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, which means that God has not left us to stumble alone in the dark, but instead He's given us His Word to show us the way to go. And so that's why we read together now, starting at verse 22. And the scribes who came down for Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. I invite you to pray with me as we come to this portion of God's word. Our Father in heaven, we praise you again for bringing us together in person this morning. And we ask that we wouldn't gloss over that, we wouldn't take it for granted, but you'd remind us of what a privilege it is to be with one another and to come together into your presence. We thank you for your word that you've given to us, and that we wouldn't be left alone, that we're not orphans in a merciless universe, but you are a good and loving Father, and you speak to us and you instruct us. We ask that you would instruct us this morning by your word that you would encourage us, and that you would challenge us. And most of all, that you would help us to see Jesus as the most glorious, the most beautiful, and the most powerful as our Lord and our Savior. We thank you that we can ask these things boldly because we ask them in his name. Amen. If you uh, think back to elementary school or even junior high or high school, maybe you're in uh, that stage now, you'll remember one of the obnoxious things about uh, starting a new fall semester as you begin a new math class 
is that your textbook begins with covering a bunch of things that you already learned the year before. In fact, it seems like at times the first couple chapters are just review of the previous year. Now, that's for a reason, and the reason is this. You forgot everything over the summer. And this is why wise parents uh, continue math drills for their children over the summer. It's not because they're cruel and heartless, uh, but it's because they want them to hit the ground running. Uh, We have our uh, similar issue here this morning as we jump back into the Gospel of Mark. We have not looked at this uh, since November, but we come and we meet these characters, the scribes, who we've seen before. Verse 22, the scribes come down from Jerusalem. We first encountered the scribes in chapter 1. You'll remember Jesus was teaching in the synagogue, and the crowds had this dramatic response to him. As Jesus was, remember, in Capernaum, which is next to or on the shore of Galilee, in the region uh, of Galilee. And Jesus uh, is teaching in such a powerful way that we're told this in verse 22, the people are astonished because he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And then we're told later in verse 27, the people say, what is this? A new teaching with authority. It's important for us to understand that the scribes were these Bible teachers or Bible experts of their time. And so we would understand that Jesus, as he comes as this authoritative teacher, is naturally going to threaten their power and their influence. Perhaps Jesus threatens their livelihood as well. And so at this point, we begin what we're going to see throughout the rest of the gospel, which is that Jesus is on a collision course with the scribes. They know that his presence and his teaching challenges them and threatens them. In fact, if we look forward in the story of Mark, we'll see that the scribes are intimately directly involved in the plot to kill Jesus. The last time we see them in chapter 15, the next to last chapter, it's with them saying this, the scribes are mocking Jesus and they say, he saved others, he cannot save himself. And so with that background, we understand why the scribes are so hostile to Jesus and his teaching. He presents a direct threat to them and everything that they hold dear, their power, their influence, their authority, their meaning, and their identity. And so it should not surprise us here as they come up against Jesus that they run the play that they do. Uh, They cannot refute the reality of Jesus' power. Everyone's able to see the fact that Jesus is casting out demons and he's healing the sick. And so they realize they're going to have to take a different tactic if they want to gain any momentum. And so instead of attacking the reality of his power, they look to refute its source and its origin. And that's the confrontation here we see in verse 22. They tell us that Jesus is actually fighting for the wrong side. He's possessed by Beelzebul, And by the prince of demons, he cast out demons. They can't dispute the fact that Jesus is powerful, and so they try to discredit him. They try to discredit his legitimacy, his motives, his goodness. In fact, what they want people to think is that there's something evil and wicked, dubious, questionable about Jesus. This reference to Beelzebul and the prince of demons here, there's a disagreement about what exactly is being referred to, whether this is Satan or just some demonic force. Uh, What we need to know is that they are saying that Jesus is working in league with powerful forces of evil in this world. Uh, This is something we're familiar with in our world as well. We would call it um, a conspiracy theory. Someone comes to you and says, look, it looks like X, it's actually Y. It looks like uh, in Star Wars Episode One, Jar Jar Binks is a bumbling idiot. What's actually going on is that he's a great, powerful Sith Lord. If you know how to read between the lines, you know uh, what's actually going on. Uh, This is what they're saying about Jesus. It appears like Acts, like he's this great teacher who's come to do good for the sake of God and his kingdom. But we as the teachers are here to tell you it's actually why. It's the exact opposite. He appears harmless. He's actually working for the devil. This word, verse 22, possessed, is a serious, uh, powerful word. Now, we're familiar with that in our culture, that people take um, serious, powerful words and they throw them around like they're nothing. So people might say something like this, oh, he's a narcissist. She's crazy. They throw those around like it's nothing. Well, being a narcissist is actually a pretty serious clinical diagnosis. Uh, Being crazy is not a light thing. 
And so when they accuse Jesus of being possessed here, what they're saying is he's not just evil, he's actually crazy, he's unstable, he's out of control. He is as dangerous as the very demons he's coming up against. He's a social liability. In other words, don't let your kids play too close to Jesus. When Jesus comes around in the neighborhood, you're going to want to pull them inside. You think he's bringing goodness? Uh, He's actually very dangerous. Do you think he's the ice cream man? No, Jesus is actually a drug dealer, okay? He's the opposite of what you think that he is. The point uh, for us this morning is this. As we encounter Jesus, as we get closer to him, we will see his power more and more clearly. The closer we get to Jesus, the more clearly we will see his power. That demands a response. I pointed out before that some have noted that as the book of Mark continues, we're going to see three character groups shrink into two character groups. The three character groups at the beginning are those for Jesus, those against Jesus, and then just the crowds. As the gospel continues, that middle group is going to recede and we're going to be left with two groups, those who are following Jesus and those who are opposed to Jesus. In other words, it is hard, if not impossible, to engage fully with Jesus and his power and remain neutral. It is hard to engage fully with Jesus and his power and remain neutral. Another way of saying it would be this. It is dangerous for you to be here this morning. I've told you before that knowledge is dangerous. And it's dangerous because Jesus demands a response. And so the more and more you encounter him, the more you hear about him, the more you know of him, the more a response is demanded from you. You cannot get close to Jesus without seeing his power. You cannot see Jesus' power without having to make a choice. The scribes here uh, model that for us. There's one of two choices, and they've chosen to oppose Jesus rather than to follow him. With this accusation coming up against him, Jesus decides to dismantle their argument. It sounds like they are speaking around Jesus, and instead, uh, Jesus decides to speak to them. So we see in verse 23, he calls them to him. He decides it's time, it's story time for the scribes. The scribes are gossiping around Jesus. Jesus is going to bring them in. It's time for them to sit down in a circle and hear uh, what Jesus has to say. And Jesus, of course, starts out with this rhetorical question, verse 23, how can Satan cast out Satan? And then instead of waiting for an answer, he provides his own answer with these two parables, very short, one in verse 24, one in verse 25, both making the same point, both with repetition. One is a kingdom, one's a house, In both verses, we see the phrase divided against itself. Verse 24 says, kingdom cannot stand. Verse 25, house will not be able to stand. And then he brings it home for us in verse 26. What's true of houses and kingdoms is also true about Satan. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. And it's with verse 26 that Jesus applies it and brings it home to remind them this is absolute and complete nonsense. Jesus is not, or Satan is not going to fight against himself, okay? But let's, for the sake of theory, say that he is fighting against himself. If he is fighting against himself, verse 26, he is coming to an end. In other words, If it's true that I am fighting Satan with Satan, if I am a demonic force casting out demonic forces, then it is time for you all, the scribes, to throw a party. It is time to celebrate. It's time to rejoice because you know that the end of evil is near. If Satan is fighting himself, then Satan is coming to an end. Don't complain. 
Don't accuse me. Be happy. You should want me to continue what I'm doing because if I keep doing it, I'm going to bring Satan down faster than anyone else. Then he explains, verse 27, how you would actually need to bring Satan down. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. Now, we don't talk about strong men in this way in our culture. Uh, If we were going to say it in Cheyenne Mountain Presbyterian terms, we'd say it like this. Uh, You don't break into a house where the guns are loaded. How can you, right? You can't. You don't break into the house when the shotgun is loaded beside the bed. You don't break into the house when the AR-15 is loaded on top of the refrigerator. That doesn't make sense. You must first eliminate the homeowner, then you can take the house. Okay, you're suggesting something that makes no sense at all. And so Jesus here presents a logical argument that's flawless, and he is setting up these scribes for a trap. He has them in a bind now, okay? Because follow the logic here. If the demons are being cast out and you have admitted that they are, then it must mean that the strong man has been bound. If the demons are being cast out, which you've just admitted that you are, they are, you've said, I'm casting out demons. The only way that can be true is if the strong man has been bound. That's the only way I could be casting out these demons. So therefore, you have to admit, I have bound the strong man. Okay, Jesus has them in a trap that they can't escape. I have bound the strong man, I'm plundering his house. In other words, I have actually bound Satan and now I am plundering him. I have bound Satan and now I'm taking what's most valuable to him. I have bound Satan and now I'm restraining him and controlling him. For us this morning, the point is this. We are here together in this church on January 9th because we believe that the real and true power of God is at work in this world and it has restrained and bound the power of Satan. We believe that Jesus bound Satan by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in the world with tremendous force and power. We believe that we need and can only defeat evil with supernatural power that God provides as he binds and restrains evil in all its forces, whether it's Beelzebul or the prince of demons or Satan himself. Jesus' power, in other words, is so great that he and only he is able to tie Satan's hands behind his back. Jesus proclaims that to him, them here clearly and directly. We are not capable of binding the strong man of evil. We are not being capable of binding Satan himself. And Jesus is capable and has done it. Jesus is capable and is doing it here in this passage. Jesus came to put devil, evil and the devil to end once and for all by putting death to death. Yes, in other words, I am casting out Satan because I have bound him. For us, then, we must come to terms with Jesus' supernatural power in this world as he binds and restrains and puts an end to evil. We see it at work even now as we look around. One of the works, one of the ways in which we see God's power in the world is his transformational power at work in the church. In Ephesians chapter one, Paul tells us that the very same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that's at work in the lives of Christians now. In Ephesians chapter two, Paul goes on to tell us that without God's work in our lives, we are not just incapable, we are actually dead to sin. We have no spiritual life that we can claim or speak of. We are powerless without God. 
And so that's why we come here every Sunday because we believe in supernatural power. We ask for that power as we begin our worship service in the morning with our call to worship. We ask for the power to be able to see God and worship him as people who would be spiritually dead unless he comes and helps us. We see God's power binding and restraining evil in the world, not just inside of the church, but outside of the church. The very foundation of human rights, which we take for granted in the West, is grounded in scripture. It is a novel and new concept that being a human being is something holy and sacred that's meant to be honored and valued. We cannot find that story outside of God's work in the world. And so what we see today as we look around in our world is we see what's often called people who want the kingdom, but they no longer want the king. They want the kingdom, but they no longer want the king. They love the things that Jesus brings into this world. They love the way in which evil is held back and restrained, but they don't want the one who holds it back. The problem is this, you can take the fruit, you can forget the tree and chop it down, but what's gonna happen? There's not gonna be any more fruit, right? You can only have the kingdom without the king for so long. You wanna see the power of evil in the world? What does evil love? Evil loves death and decay and destruction. What did Jesus do? Jesus put death to death. And so as we forget the king that gives us the kingdom, that's where we find ourselves in a place where the culture of death is on the rise, where suicide and despair become more normalized, where euthanasia and worse is promoted and normalized. You cannot get rid of the king and expect to keep his kingdom. You cannot look at the restraint of evil in this world and make the mistake of crediting it to anyone else than Jesus the King who is powerful enough and able to bind and restrain the strong man. And if you do, you can't expect to keep the benefits of the kingdom. In other words, Jesus still casts out the power of of evil. Jesus still casts it out today. We see it at work also in transformational, restorative, loving power rather than oppressive and exploitative power. We see it in the power that changes hearts and lives and communities. We see it as the power that expands. Remember, we talked in Genesis about the fact that the gospel is gone across cultures, across times, across languages. We see it as the power that conquers evil as it opposes it and fights it. We see it as the power that heals, the power that stands against cancel culture, which is a culture with no grace, no way forward, no future, no forgiveness. We see it as the power that comes to oppose and destroy evil. And so like the scribes, As we, when we, while we see Jesus' power at work, we have to make a choice. Will we worship him or will we reject him? Will we worship him or will we reject him? As we look at the gospel of Mark, we see ultimately and finally there are only two choices in this world. Will we look to Jesus as the one who can bind and restrain the influence of evil in our lives and in the world, or will we struggle and fight against him? Brothers and sisters, the decision of how, uh, that you make of how you respond to Jesus and his power is the most important decision you will ever make. How you choose to respond to Jesus and his power is the most important decision you will ever make. You will either reject him or embrace him. There is no third way. Jesus' power is real. The only question is how we respond to it. Jesus goes on here to give this confusing and sobering warning uh, that we're going to spend just a moment on where he talks about 
the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Uh, The question for us is, what in the world is Jesus talking about if he's saying there's something that people can't be forgiven of? And to understand this, uh, we need to interpret verses 28 and 29 through the lens of what comes after and what comes before. In other words, we interpret this hard saying through the lens of verse 30 and verses 27 through 30. So in verse 30, when it says for... What it means is this is why he's saying this. This is what explains it. And why he says it helps us understand what he's saying. Verse 30, it says, For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Verse 29 talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Okay, verse 30 repeats, verse 22, He's possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. So the context, the passage here, is providing us the definition of what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. In short, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is crediting the work of the Holy Spirit to an evil spirit. It's verse 29, verses verse 30. Verse 30, the Holy Spirit, or verse 29, the Holy Spirit, verse 30, they say, the unclean spirit. In other words, willful, entrenched denial of God's work in the world is the unforgivable sin here. Okay, Entrenched, willful denial of God's work in the world is the unforgivable sin. The scribes can see God's power. They verbally acknowledge it. They've just said that Jesus is casting out demons. They're staring it in the face, and yet they credit it to evil rather than to good. Big picture, what I want you to see here is that this is confirming uh, what we already know. It's not, not introducing a new concept, It's not introducing uh, some sort of loophole. It's God will forgive every sin except the the sin of rejecting his offer to forgive every sin. God will forgive every sin except the sin of rejecting his offer to forgive every sin. It's reinforcing and confirming what we already know. If you want God to forgive your sins, you have to repent and believe. You have to accept his forgiveness. Okay. Another way of putting it is this. Those who dismiss God's power as anything but supernatural are on the way to destruction. And so the word of comfort uh, for those who have tender consciences, who are concerned or worried about whether they've con- uh, committed the unforgivable sin is this. Those people who have committed the unforgivable sin don't worry about it. And so if you're worried that you've committed the unforgivable sin, that's a good sign that you haven't committed the unforgivable sin. Because God will forgive every sin except the sin of rejecting his offer to forgive every sin. Okay, unforgivable sin, we're going to put that aside. The point for us is this. We're responsible for what we do with and how we respond to the work of God in the world. Okay, we're responsible for what we do with and how we respond to the work of God in the world. And in fact, if we focus on the, <clears throat> the unforgivable sin, we've sort of missed the main point of verses 28 through 30. Because in fact, it is the exception that proves the rule. We've skipped, we've forgotten what it says in verse 28. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. All sins will be forgiven. All sorts and kinds and types of blasphemies will be forgiven. Now I want you to think about how serious that is. Blasphemy, by definition, is speaking against God. There's a sense in which Saul, who became the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, was a blasphemer. Okay? Now I want you to think about how you respond to people who blaspheme you. People who speak against you. You might say something like this. I'll forgive her, uh, but we'll never be friends again. I'll never forget what he said. I still find myself angry when I remember that. Compare that to, contrast that to, 
what we find here, which is that there's this reminder that we are in the midst of a great cosmic struggle and battle. And in that war, God welcomes and befriends his enemies. God welcomes and befriends people who speak against him. God welcomes and befriends people who blaspheme him. Even more than that, he adopts them. And so what we see in this passage is the overwhelming power of God's grace. All sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. As God's power is at work in the world, restraining and binding evil, we cannot and must not forget that the evil he restrains and binds includes the evil that we find in ourselves as we rebel against him. And in the midst of that, despite of that, God comes in his graciousness, just like we saw him in the garden in Genesis 3 during Advent, and he pursues and chases after his people. He comes to people who oppose him and rebel against him and blaspheme him to save them from the forces of evil in this world. God is at work coming after and chasing people who hate him. He is doing what Romans chapter five, verse eight reminds us that while we were sinners, that Christ died for us. It's as we encounter Jesus' power that we realize and are reminded and understand that we are the ones who have been fighting against it and opposing it. And instead of destroying us, Jesus comes and is willing to welcome us, adopt us and forgive us. Verse 28, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. Jesus' power is visible. His forgiveness is real. The only question is how you will respond to his power. Do you respond in the way of faith and repentance? Or are you like the scribes and you find anything else that you can attribute it to? Who is Jesus? Jesus is the one who binds a strong man. Jesus is the one with control and authority over even the most powerful evil forces in this world. And he's the one who comes to forgive all sins and all blasphemies. How do we respond to him? If this is the type of savior that we're dealing with, if this is the type of power that he has, then what sort of response does Jesus demand for us The greatest power demands the response of the greatest loyalty, response, commitment, devotion. Remember, we've talked about before when the negative response doesn't fit us. In other words, when we don't find ourselves blaspheming the Holy Spirit, we look for the accompanying positive response. The positive response here is this, affirm the supernatural work of God through the Holy Spirit in the world. Receive it in our lives, welcome it, fan it into flame. Recognize King Jesus as the one with all ultimate rule and reign and authority in this world and the one that we can trust and look to to protect us and our loved ones. Look to him as the one who is a more powerful spirit, even more than that, the most powerful spirit. Look to him as one who comes with a more powerful kingdom. In fact, the most powerful kingdom. And remember that he is the one who demands a decision, and a response. I invite you to look with me in your worship guide on pages five and six. We have this famous quote from C.S. Lewis who also gets at this problem that when we come to Jesus, we have two options. We can decide that he's either evil or that he is God himself. There is no third way. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying that really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is one of the things we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, 
You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. You must make your choice. Brothers and sisters, who do you say that Jesus is? And how will you respond to him? Will you worship him or will you reject him? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that no matter what happens to us as we walk in this world, we know how the story ends. It ends with you on a throne ruling and reigning. And we know who has the most power and authority and control. It's you who have bound and are binding and will bind the forces of evil in this world. We ask that you would remind us of the reality of your power and you would call us to respond to it. That we would respond to it with trust and faith in you and your son. We ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you